I feel like a parrot. Go ahead. <laughs> this is Tommy, Tom DeFonte. He's a director of the Electronic Visualization Lab from the engineering side of the house. And, and this is Dan Sandine, who's director of the Electronic Visualization Lab from the art side of the house. And he's also in a previous incarnation on this monitor here from with braids. like 15 years ago. And we've been doing collaborations of uh, artists and scientists for longer than 15 years. We have the longest and oldest program offering an MFA that is a joint program. But uh, our idea has never really been to kind of like bump engineers against artists and see what happens. Our idea has always been that the artists learn enough technology, enough programming, enough about the tools to be able to carry on in a highly competent way. And the engineers learn enough about uh, the importance of presenting information visually so that they can go ahead and incorporate that into their life. One of the, I think, fundamental parts of our philosophy here is we've, generally speaking, chosen to have lots of equipment of the same type at a lower cost rather than uh, single instances of very expensive equipment because we feel that, that people have to have all the time in the world on computers, that they can't work within a schedule if they're really going to discover things and do things that really look different and have a message. And one of the things that's really missing in a lot of computer art and a lot of the things that we see in the cigarette film and video show, for instance, is something that has a message. Uh, the interactive image was a, is a testbed of ideas. We've been doing various types of uh, computer-assisted instruction for the past 15 or 20 years. But we wanted to get to the things that computers could do that you can't do on blackboards and 3 by 5 file cards. The interactive image allows you to interact with things. And basically, I think that we pop through a whole new level in the presentation quality of the screens, how the screens look, and in the intensity and exquisiteness of the interaction. As a designer, I was also a software developer. I did a game that was part of the original installation. I'm very familiar with how RT1 works. I was able to program in graphic techniques that best took advantage of the programming that was available. In developing the visual formats for this set of games, there were several objectives that we set out to achieve. The most important objective was that we make the games easy to play, that people from all different experience levels, backgrounds, interest levels, all different ages from preschool through seniors be able to play the games. This is the first section of the game and the one most recommended for beginners. It's drool resistant, but I wouldn't say it's drool proof. Um, this is basically an image processing game. What's it called? Quark. Quark. <laughs> There's not much reason behind why it's called Quark. How's my shirt saying? Well, my shirt says I only wear a suit when I ask for a lot of money. Oh, and me? Well, I was responsible for fundraising and, of course, documentation. And we have plenty of that as to what was all in the show. And, uh, and then, of course, public relations and publicity. And the media was wonderful. We got a lot of stories, computer graphics and applications, computer graphics world, videography, even made it on the cover of computers and physics and local technology publications. So the press was very kind to us. People were really excited about the show, and so were we. We're now traveling some of the interactive computer-based components to SIGGRAPH 88, and then the show will go on to the Computer Museum in Boston, where it will become part of a permanent display this coming winter. We are interested in interactive real-time graphics, either applied to a museum environment or an art show environment, or in the realm of scientific visualization. Most recently, Tom Defani and I were co-editors of a report, Visualization and Scientific Computing, along with Bruce McCormick at Texas A&M University. And uh, 
in the area of scientific visualization, we want to give scientists these interactive tools, whether they're using it in their office or across networks uh, connected to supercomputers somewhere else. This big phallic form spews out billions and billions of numbers which I use for artistic purposes. They're scientific images, but I use them to create art. And uh, I colorize them in the game, and there's nine images currently in the game which have come from various computations from the new whole era of computational science. Using the game and with the learn module that is attached to each level of the game, you learn the theory, the additive color theory behind this, and also you learn about mapping in the colors, pixel values, zoom functions, and how this works with the supercomputer images, and how scientists use pseudocolor in their visualizations in order to clarify the pixel values when they come out of the computer. Certainly, this astrophysical jet which we see here could be hundreds of thousands of light years in length, uh, in length. That 100,000 light years in length, that's a very long jet. We're never going to be able to directly experience that. So we simulate it. It's sort of the simulacra of our society. It's in science, it's in art. And I really believe that because of computer graphics, we are experiencing a convergence of art and science. I think that we are seeing a fuzzy boundary syndrome here and there's been a nonlinear branching process in the arts and what we have here are artists that are doing science and we have scientists that are doing art and this is ever so apparent it's SIGGRAPH. There were other more detailed goals one of which was to use completely generic equipment in the uh, setups that you see here and that will be at SIGGRAPH the only non-generic component is the cabling going between the generic video game interface and the uh, IBM PC clone. Everything else is completely purchasable, standard from several sources, so that it is clonable. Although many people think I'm a good programmer and I've been doing this for a long time, as a matter of fact, I'm practically congenitally ill-equipped to program. I can't type the same letter sequence twice in a row. And, uh, but with the language that Tom developed, I'm, uh, because I can recover from my errors so quickly and accurately that I'm able to, you know, make you know, many mistakes per line and still end up uh, making progress. As with the other games you'll see or have seen, the, uh, the interface is a joystick or trackball joystick, in this case a couple of buttons that run most of the game, and then a row of three buttons that are ancillary that start the game off, restart the game, get you help messages, and get you into learning modules. But ignoring those for the moment, First thing I'm going to do is go over to the left and grab the Julia set. And uh, here I get to choose three different paths. I'm going to choose the one that is most uncontrolled. I can go anywhere. And now I'm in the Julia set part of the game. Now it starts out being the circle, or thanks to on square pixels, an ellipse. And uh, one of the things I really like about the Julia set is it proves to me that a circle is a degenerate fractal. I'm moving the joystick around. I am generating in real time Julia sets. And you notice on the right there, I have little copies of the Mandelbrot set. That's showing me kind of where I am on the Mandelbrot set when I'm generating the Julia set. This game is called Graftals. Complex shapes from simple set of rules. And what we're gonna, what we try to teach the, the player is using a simple input called a string and a set of rules, you can make complex lifelike shapes. This is ideally suited to computer graphics because it doesn't take up much computer memory. And the way the program executes is, is recursively, repetitively, which is something computers do well. The way the computer represents when you branch is um, by a bracket. So as you can see, a zero followed by a one is a yellow branch with a red branch growing out of it. A zero followed by a one surrounded by brackets is a yellow branch followed by a red branch at an angle, and so on and so forth. What the, set, the first set of rules does is turns this string, which I'm building here, into a much longer, more complicated string, which we then 
interpret as a tree. It could be interpreted as any complicated structure. One of the ideas behind the game was to let the viewers invent like their own forest. Uh, the actual tree generation for this program was um, written in C, and it was based on uh, some on formal language theory, actually based on a paper by Alvy Ray Smith. This is Eric. Eric is broken up into three parts. The first one is tessellation, the second one is kaleidoscope, and the third part is animation. What they all have in common is that they all use different symmetries to create different kinds of patterns. Um, the first part of the game, tessellation, creates patterns that um, are make composed of tiles which interlock with each other without leaving any gaps or overlaps between them. The mathematics behind the part, the tessellation, are the same that M.C. Escher, the artist, used to create his kind of images. Kaleidoscope also lets you draw with these reinforced symmetries, but it's a little less constrictive than tessellations are. If you choose the option to draw a pattern, you can then pick the symmetry that you want enforced on your drawing, either radial symmetry, mirror symmetry, or translation. Or in animation, let's take a look at one of the Learn More modules. You can either see animation, you would pick the starting shape, either spirals or waves or lines, and you could see those animate, or you could learn more about how the animation works. This is Xanimation Junior, developed by Fred Deck who's on vacation right now, so he couldn't be here. This game teaches cyclical animation and interpolation. It lets you build up your own screens and create shapes interpolating between the two of them. We'll start with the horse. And here we're moving the joystick to adjust the size of the horse. And we're going to pick a second shape. Let's do a train. And again, we pick the size for the train. We're going to position the first object on the path. And now the computer will build up 16 screens for the animation, interpolating between the two shapes we picked. We're controlling the speed of the animation on the joystick by moving it right and left. Here I have it to the farthest left position, and as I move it right, it slows down. The next thing that you can do is continue to work with the same set of screens, screens building animations on top of animations. And the general approach here is to build tools and to give people uh, tool sets that they can understand. We think that both artists and engineers ought to understand their tools before they start to use them and, and design tools that make it easy to understand and, and understand more as you need it. Visualization in general is what we do. Scientific visualization, artistic visualization in my mind are, are effectively the same thing. You've got people trying to do uh, unique discoveries into, into scientific and visual realms. Continue to explore the picture in this manner. Thank you. 